Hello, my name is Bioma Chha and I'll be your instructor for the next 30 minutes covering the module on climate change. Climate change today is shaped by challenges that are increasingly unpredictable and context-driven. The effects of climate change are increasingly non-linear and difficult to forecast. As a lawyer, one needs to be well-versed in the history of the climate change problem, understand the science behind it, and accordingly prepare for the legal and policy responses to address the issue of climate change. The law of climate change thus involves a wide gamut of issues and its better understanding. In today's module, we try and introduce students to the developing field of climate change law. We begin with providing a sufficient background to the history of the climate change problem. We then explore the science behind the issue of climate change and then proceed to highlight the major international legal instruments to address the issue of climate change. In 2007-8, the United Nations Development Program's Human Development Report referred to climate change as the defining human development challenge of the 21st century. It called climate change not just a future scenario, rather something that has overwhelming scientific evidence pointing towards irreversible ecological catastrophe. The impacts of climate change were said to be global in scope and unprecedented in scale. Taking a look at when the problem of climate change emerged for the first time, the World Meteorological Organization, or the WMO, in association with the United Nations Environment Program, or the UNEP, convened the first World Climate Conference in February 1979 in Geneva. This was a landmark event as it was the first major international meeting on climate change attended by scientists from a wide range of disciplines. The purpose of this meeting was to assess the state of knowledge of climate and to consider the effects of climate variability and climate change on human society. Following the first World Conference on Climate, the World Climate Program and the World Climate Research Programs were established. The aim of these two scientific programs was to develop fundamental scientific understanding of the physical climate system and the extent of human influence on climate. Following the creation of the World Climate Program and the World Climate Research Program, in 1998, the WMO and the UNEP created the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. The IPCC was a scientific intergovernmental body which aimed to assess scientific information relevant to human-induced climate change the impacts of such human-induced climate change, and the options for adaptation or mitigation. In 1990, the IPCC published its first assessment report, where it found that climate change was the result of anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide, that is, emissions resulting from human activities. There was a substantial increase in the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases which in turn enhanced the greenhouse effect, resulting on average in an additional warming of the Earth's surface. The first assessment report of the IPCC further found that carbon dioxide was responsible for over half the enhanced greenhouse gas effect in the past and was likely to remain so in the future. And stabilization of atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases at today's levels, that is, 1990 levels, would require immediate reduction of emissions from human activities by over 60 percent. The first assessment report of the IPCC later served to be the basis of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, something which we will cover in a few more moments. The IPCC in turn has now become a well-established player in reviewing worldwide climate science research, issuing regular assessment reports, and compiling special reports and technical papers on the science behind climate change. The findings of these IPCC assessment reports reflect global scientific consensus and frequently play a major role in international climate negotiations. 
Since 1990, the IPCC has released five assessment reports that have reached the conclusion that climate change is a real problem and that climate change is a man-made problem. The fourth assessment report of the IPCC was released in 2007 and propelled climate change into popular consciousness with its observations and future projections on climate change impacts. Some of the key findings of the fourth assessment report are as follows. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, as is now evident from observations of increases in global average air and ocean temperatures, widespread melting of snow and ice, and a rising global average sea level. Second, most of the global average warming over the past 50 years has very likely been caused due to human activities. Impacts of climate change will very likely increase due to increased frequencies and intensities of extreme weather events. Anthropogenic warming and sea level rise would also continue for centuries if greenhouse gas emissions were to be reduced sufficiently for concentrations to stabilize today, simply due to the time scales associated with climate processes and feedbacks. Some planned adaptation of human activities is occurring now, but more extensive adaptation is required to reduce the vulnerability to climate change. Unmitigated climate change would, in the long term, be likely to exceed the capacity of natural, managed, and human systems to adapt. The most conclusive finding of the fourth assessment report was that many impacts of climate change can be reduced, delayed, or avoided by mitigation. Later, the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize was shared in equal parts between the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and Al Gore for both their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such change. In 2013, IPCC released its fifth assessment report that has provided more clarity about human-induced climate change than ever before. Some of the key findings of the fifth assessment report are that agricultural yields are expected to drop in most regions of the world if the temperature increase is more than a few degrees. Diseases, especially those carried by vectors like mosquitoes, could spread to newer areas in the world. Millions of people are expected to be exposed to increasing water stress, as well as unprecedented flooding. More intense weather-related disasters combined with rising sea levels and other climate-related stresses will make the lives of those living on coastlines particularly vulnerable, and extinctions are expected from the current warming trends. These findings are in addition to the conclusive scientific evidence which was presented in the previous assessment reports of the IPCC, proving or implying that climate change is a man-made problem. Having taken a look at the scientific evidence behind the issue of climate change, we now try and proceed to understand what the international legal response to this has been. As I mentioned earlier, the first assessment report of the IPCC ended up proving to be the basis for the creation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Or popularly known as the UNFCCC. The UNFCCC today is the principal legal instrument adopted by states to address the issue of climate change. The treaty was negotiated at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, also known as the Earth Summit held at Rio in 1992. The ultimate objective of the treaty is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Currently, there are 196 countries which are parties to the convention. The Conference of Parties, or the COP, is the supreme body of the UNFCCC, which aims to assess the progress in dealing with the issue of climate change. All parties to the UNFCCC are represented at the COP, which meets every year unless the parties decide otherwise. The COP reviews the implementation of the Convention and any other legal instruments that have been adopted by the COP, 
and is responsible for all decision making to ensure the effective implementation of the ultimate objectives of the UNFCCC. The parties to the UNFCCC note that the largest share of historical and current global emissions of greenhouse gases has originated in developed countries, that the per capita emissions in developing countries are still relatively low, and that the share of global emissions originating in developing countries will grow to meet their social and developmental needs. As a result, the convention puts the onus on developed countries to lead the way in combating climate change. In pursuance of this, the UNFCCC recognizes the countries of the world as Annex 1 or non-Annex 1 countries. According to the UNFCCC, Annex 1 countries belong to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Group, or the OECD. These include 12 countries with economies in transition from Central and Eastern Europe as well. Non-Annex 1 countries are parties to the UNFCCC that are not listed in Annex 1 and comprise mostly of low-income developing countries. In particular, the difference between these two groups or categories of countries is that Annex 1 countries were expected to stabilize their greenhouse gas emissions at 1990 levels by the year 2000, and non-Annex 1 countries did not have any such legally binding targets to either reduce or limit their greenhouse gas emissions. Moving further, Article 3 of the UNFCCC provides the basis for another core principle of the climate change regime that of the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Article 3.1 specifically says that parties should protect the climate system for the benefit of present and future generations of humankind on the basis of equity and in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Accordingly, the developed country parties should take the lead in combating climate change and the adverse effects thereof. Moving on, the UNFCCC lays down certain commitments on the developed country parties. In particular, according to Article 4.3 of the Convention, developed country parties and other developed parties included in Annex 2 of the Convention should provide financial support including the transfer of technology to help support climate change activities in developing countries. We will study further about this particular point in the module on financial mechanisms and technology transfer. Moving on from the UNFCCC, we try and understand the origins of the Kyoto Protocol, the next major international legal instrument to address the problem of climate change. In 1995, the parties to the UNFCCC launched further negotiations to strengthen the global response to climate change after they realized that the emissions reduction provisions in the UNFCCC were proving to be inadequate. The UNFCCC, in a sense, was considered to be legally non-binding because it neither set mandatory limits on the greenhouse gas emissions for countries nor did it contain any enforcement mechanisms. The UNFCCC, however, did allow for the adoption of additional protocols to the Convention, which then led countries to adopt the Kyoto Protocol to the UNFCCC in 1997. The Kyoto Protocol, or the Protocol, is an international treaty that legally binds developed country parties or Annex I parties to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It, however, contains no binding emission reduction commitments for non-Annex 1 parties. Basically, the Kyoto Protocol operationalized the UNFCCC as it committed industrialized countries to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions based on the principles of the UNFCCC, whereas the UNFCCC only encouraged countries to do so. Some of the key features of the Kyoto Protocol were that it was structured on the principles of the Convention. It also placed a heavier burden on developed countries under the central principle of the common but differentiated responsibility, 
also. It only binds developed countries to emission reduction targets because it recognized their responsibility for the historical and current high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Presently, 192 countries are parties to the Kyoto Protocol. But most significantly, the United States of America, which was the highest emitter of greenhouse gases at the time the protocol was signed, has not ratified the protocol till date. The Conference of Parties, or the COP, also serves as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol. This is called the Conference of the Parties, serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol, CMP. The CMP meets annually during the exact same period as the COP, and the first CMP was held in conjunction with the 11th session of the COP in 2005 at Montreal in Canada. The Kyoto Protocol has been divided into two significant commitment periods. The first commitment period applies to emissions between 2008 and 2012, and the second commitment period applies to emissions between 2013 and 2020. During the first commitment period, the protocol set binding emission reduction targets for Annex I parties under the UNFCCC. The Kyoto Protocol, however, entered into force only on 16 February 2005 after a very long ratification period. You would notice that it was signed in the year 1997. The Kyoto also contains certain mechanisms which allows country to reduce emissions. Although parties are bound to meet their emission reduction targets through domestic action, that is by reducing emissions onshore, the Kyoto Protocol allows parties to meet part of their targets through three other flexible market-based mechanisms that ideally encourage greenhouse gas abatement to start where it could be most cost-effective, for example, in the developing world. The three Kyoto mechanisms that we will next cover are the international emissions trading, the clean development mechanism, and the joint implementation. Under the international emissions trading mechanism, Parties with commitments under the Kyoto Protocol have accepted targets for limiting or reducing emissions. These targets are expressed as levels of allowed emissions or assigned amounts over the first commitment period. The allowed emissions are further divided into assigned amount units or AAUs. Article 17 of the Protocol envisages emissions tradings and allows countries that have emission units to spare, that is, emissions permitted for them but not used, to sell this excess capacity to countries that have gone over their targets. Therefore, the international emissions trading mechanism created a new commodity in the form of carbon reduction or carbon removal. Therefore, carbon is now tracked or traded like any other commodity and this is what is known as the carbon market. The second mechanism under the Kyoto is the clean development mechanism. Under Article 12 of the protocol, the clean development mechanism, or the CDM, allows a country with an emission reduction commitment to implement an emission reduction project in a developing country. These projects can in turn earn saleable certified emission reduction credits each equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide, which can then be counted towards meeting their Kyoto targets. This mechanism stimulates sustainable development and emissions reduction while giving industrialized countries some flexibility in how they meet their emission reduction or limitation targets. For instance, a CDM project activity might involve a rural electrification project using solar panels or an installation of more energy efficient boiler in developing countries. The third flexible mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol is that of the joint implementation. Under Article 6 of the Protocol, the joint implementation allows a country with an emission reduction commitment to implement an emission reduction project in another developed country. 
notice how it is different from the CDM where such a project could happen in another developing country. Projects under the joint implementation mechanism can earn emission reduction units each equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide which is later counted towards meeting its Kyoto target. The joint implementation offers parties a flexible and cost efficient means of fulfilling a part of their Kyoto commitments while the host party benefits from foreign investment and technology transfer from the other developed country party. There are also specific rules under the Kyoto Protocol that oblige countries to monitor the actual emissions and maintain precise records of the trades carried out. Registry systems track and record transactions by parties under these market-based mechanisms. The UNFCCC Secretariat, based in Bonn in Germany, keeps an international transaction log to verify what transactions are consistent with the rules of the protocol. Further, parties are required to submit annual emissions inventories and national reports at regular intervals. Article 5 of the protocol commits Annex 1 parties to having in place no later than 2007 national systems for the estimation of greenhouse gas emissions by sources or removals by sinks. Article 7 requires Annex 1 parties to submit annual greenhouse gas inventories as well as national communications at regular intervals, both including supplementary information to demonstrate compliance with the protocol. Article 8 establishes the expert review teams that will review these inventories and national communications submitted by Annex 1 parties. The Kyoto Protocol also has a compliance mechanism which is designed to strengthen the protocol's environmental integrity, support the carbon market's credibility, and ensure transparency of accounting by parties. The main objective of the compliance mechanism is to facilitate, promote, and enforce compliance with the commitments under the protocol. The compliance committee is in turn made up of two branches, a facilitative branch and an enforcement branch. The facilitative branch aims to provide advice and assistance to parties in order to promote better compliance. The enforcement branch, on the other hand, has the responsibility to determine the consequences for parties who do not meet their commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. Since the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol was scheduled to expire in 2012, parties to the convention decided to launch a process to negotiate a successor to the Kyoto Protocol. At the 13th session of the COP held in Bali in Indonesia, the international community decided to launch negotiations on the post-2012 international climate regime in order to provide a clear guidance to the parties on how they could increase their efforts to combat climate change at the end of the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Since there were several key developments towards a post-Kyoto climate regime, during successive meetings of the COP, we will now look at each of these key meetings of the COP over the last several years. COP 13 in Bali. Parties adopted the Bali Roadmap, which includes the Bali Action Plan, that launched a new comprehensive process to enable the full, effective, and sustained implementation of the Convention through long-term cooperative action now up to and beyond 2012 with the aim of reaching an agreed outcome and adopting a decision by the 15th session of the COP in Copenhagen. The Bali Action Plan was divided into five main categories or five main focus areas. The first was that of shared vision, the second mitigation, third adaptation, fourth technology and fifth, finance. This conference also established two subsidiary bodies under the convention to conduct this process. The first was the Ad Hoc Working Group on Long-Term Cooperative Action, AWG LCA, and the second was the Ad Hoc Working Group on Further Commitments for Annex 1 Parties under the Kyoto Protocol, AWG KP. Both these groups were to complete their work by 2009 and present their outcome at 
15th session of the COP in Copenhagen. COP 15, Copenhagen. There were high expectations from this meeting of the COP as it was about to produce a new global climate deal. It attracted 115 world leaders to Copenhagen. However, the end result was the Copenhagen Accord, which was not adopted by the governments formally, but only taken note of. The Copenhagen Accord managed to advance a few key issues in the negotiations. The first was the long-term goal of limiting the maximum global average temperature increase to no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The second, it committed developed countries to provide 30 billion US dollars in fast start finance for the period 2010 to 2012 and to mobilize long-term finance for further 100 billion US dollars a year by 2020 from a variety of sources. And the third was that it extended the work of the two central negotiating groups created at the Bali COP, that is the AWG LCA and the AWG KP. COP 16, Cancun. The outcome of this conference held in Cancun in Mexico in 2010 was the Cancun Agreements which are a set of significant decisions made by the international community to address the long-term challenge of climate change. It addressed the issues of mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology, and capacity buildings. One of the most important decisions to emerge from the conference was the establishment of the Green Climate Fund, which was designated as an operating entity of the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC. On technology transfer, there was the decision to establish a technology mechanism which would consist of the Technology Executive Committee as well as the Climate Technology Center and Network. We will discuss more on these financial and technology mechanisms under the UNFCCC in the module on financial mechanisms and technology transfer. Moving on to COP17 in Durban. Parties continued their work towards a post-2012 legally binding agreement and reached an agreement on the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Governments recognized the need for a universal legal agreement to deal with climate change beyond 2020. As a result, parties launched the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, or the ADP, as a subsidiary body of the Convention. One of the work plans of the ADP process is to develop a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force under the convention applicable to all parties by 2015 in order to be adopted at the 21st session of the COP to be held in Paris. COP 18, Doha. Parties decided on an amendment to the Kyoto Protocol which launched the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol from 2013 to 2020, thereby ensuring that the treaty's important legal and accounting models remain in place and underline the principle that developed countries lead mandated action to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Parties also strengthened their resolve and set out a timetable to adopt a universal climate agreement by 2015, which would come into effect in 2020 at the expiry of the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. In addition to these decisions, the work under the Bali Action Plan was wrapped up with the close of the two subsidiary bodies, the AWG LCA and the AWG KP. Therefore, the climate negotiations were streamlined to concentrate on the new work towards a 2015 climate agreement under the single negotiating stream of the ADP process. COP19 Warsaw. Parties took some essential decisions to stay on track towards securing a new climate change agreement by 2015. Governments agreed to communicate their intended nationally determined contributions towards the Universal Agreement well in advance of the meeting in Paris in December 2015. Parties also took two significant decisions at COP19. The first was the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, 
to address losses and damages associated with long-term climate change impacts in developing countries that are especially vulnerable to such impacts. The second was the Warsaw Framework for Red Plus to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and bolster forest preservation and sustainable use of forests with direct benefits for people who live in and around forests. COP21, Paris. The international climate negotiations are at a crucial juncture as countries attempt to arrive at a global deal for a post-2020 international climate regime. The international community is keenly awaiting COP21, which is to be held in Paris in December 2015, due to the likelihood of this new climate agreement that could take the form of a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force and will be applicable to all parties. Until then, it is a wait and watch to see whether there will be a new climate deal or a new climate agreement which addresses the post-2020 climate regime when the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol ends. Summing up, this module provides an introductory understanding of the history of the climate change problem as well as the science underlying the problem of climate change. We then took a closer look at the first international legal instruments to address the issue of climate change, the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol in particular. We then took a look at the implications of international climate negotiations for the development of international climate change law. This module hopes to leave you with a better understanding of the initial international legal response to climate change and the most significant developments in the international climate negotiations which are leading up to the possibility of a renewed climate regime under a new climate agreement in 2015. Thank you.